Blog Talk Radio. Good afternoon and welcome to the program. Thank you for spending another Sunday afternoon with us. Thank you for not giving up. Today, our guest is a person who will, I'm sure, become one of the heroes of this foreclosure fight. He is one and only George Babak, an attorney from Rhode Island, who were at the front rows fighting too big to fail. What's different about George is that he is not only one of the best and toughest foreclosure lawyers in the country, but he has something else, something that brings him closer not only to his clients, but to all, all of us. He gets it. What I mean is that he gets our emotional side. He understands our anger, our fears, our helplessness. And that's why people love him. People want to talk to him. People are behind him. Many lawyers say that we have to leave our emotions out of this fight if we want to win, but it's hard. It's hard for us who are not lawyers to separate emotions when you are fighting for your home, for the place that's most sacred for your family. And George gets it. He lets us be emotional. He doesn't hide his emotions from us nor from anyone else. Here is an excerpt from the letter that George sent to Brian Moynihan, Bank of America CEO, an excerpt that I know by heart. Let me stress that I don't operate from a position of fear, nor do I stand in awe of you or your company. The time has come for you to be called to task for your role in the destruction of my America. And I have to just put you all on hold for a moment because I see that George is calling my cell phone number instead the number right here in the studio. So I will be back in a couple of minutes. I apologize for this. Hi. We are back to the program. We apologize for a little misunderstanding. And uh, since I already did introduction for our guest today, one and only George Babak, I would like to welcome him live to the program. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hi, hi George. Welcome to the program. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much for um, for giving you a for giving us your time. We know that you are so busy, and I just want to let you know that right now we have listeners all around the country. I will just say a couple of states, and I apologize if I'm missing um, a lot of them, but I just want you to know that we have people from Florida, from California, from Washington State, from Michigan, from Maine, from Massachusetts, and, of course, from, from Rhode Island. So this means that you are not just a hero from your home state. You are a hero from the whole country. And um, I'm so glad that, that, that not only that you are doing this, but I'm so glad that you are so, so accessible to the, to the people. Because as I said, you, you, you couldn't hear me. I, as I said in the introduction, what is different about you is that you are not only that you are the best and the toughest from, for closure lawyers in the country, but you have something else that many of these lawyers don't have. You get us. You get our emotions. You get our anger. You get that people feel helpless. And you, you, you are not hiding your emotions. So that's why people connect with you, I think, more easily than with, with other lawyers. Well, I, I don't hide my emotions. And sometimes uh, I'm, I'm advised that, uh, that, that they get me in some trouble. But... Quite frankly, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not afraid of showing my emotions, and I'm not afraid of getting in trouble. But can I just say one thing? I, I, sure. I'm not a hero. I, I'm I'm, a, I'm just a, a simple boy from Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and, and I know that that people are saying this all over the country. But but those poor kids and those teachers uh, in Connecticut, in my in, in my mind, are real heroes. I'm just a man doing uh, what I've I've been able to do because the Holy Spirit has has imbued me with with the power and the desire to do it. Those people were put into a terrible situation and and reading the stories of what those teachers did to save those children. Those people are real heroes. I'm a mere mere man. That's all I am. I'm I'm in a position to help people, and I do it because, because it's the right thing to do. But uh, but I, I don't. I'm not a hero. I, I'm just a guy doing what what I think is right. That's all. Yes, but but that's the the actually how real heroes 
describe themselves. You don't see yourself as a hero, but for the victims and for all of us that don't know what to do and how to fight this, uh, you are one of the of the few that actually uh, that you were not afraid to stand up a long time ago before many people knew what was going on. So I, my first question for you will be like. Uh, when did you realize that we are facing the biggest financial Ponzi scheme in the in the history? And when when did you decide to actually uh, start doing uh, more research into this uh, fraud? I'll tell you the, the first case that came across my desk that I, I really questioned um, was um, probably five years ago, and um, it, you know I was in the in the midst of a. Um, I didn't really know what uh, which way I wanted to move with my practice, and it happened to come across my desk. And uh, you know, I've been a lawyer for a long time, and uh, I, I just knew that uh, looking at the documents that something was shady. And uh, in that case, um, was the the genesis for all cases to date. And in that case, uh, is still going. Uh, these these same folks are still living in their house five years later, uh, and the the bank um, just can't figure out what to do with them and they're never going to be able to figure out what to do with them quite frankly and, until they pay them um but that that's how it all started it started with that one case and you know like like the uh, example of, of taking a penny and doubling it every day for 30 days that, that's kind of what's happened i i kind of doubled the penny every day and uh mm -hmm. gotten to the point where it is now with you know, well over 1500 cases in suit um you know and that, that's kind of what's happened that's great, and and also I read once I think that was this year that you had um, a big meeting and uh, the article uh, I think the title was George Babbock's Army that was uh, I think only your clients and you met with them to give them advice and I guess to give them hope that they can that they don't have to leave the, the, their homes that they can uh, stand up and and fight and I remember that I was reading it was over 300 homeowners at that meeting. Well, that's true, but at, at this point, my my army, <laughs> my army has tripled <laughs> to this point. Um, wow! It, it's amazing because now it's it's not it's not just the the 300 clients, and that's how many there were in 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 federal court lawsuits at that point. At this point, there's well over 700. But <clears throat> what's happened is, not only now is it is it the folks that are are in the actual lawsuits, it's their families because, um, you know, it, as as Dickens said in um, in his writings, it's it's amazing how the lives of one, the life of one man, can touch so many other lives. And you know, it's again, I, I touch one life, and and my ability to help that one person stay in their home, to stay strong, to remain courageous in the face of undaunting odds, leads to his family doing the same thing. It leads to to children uh, not being evicted, so they do better on their tests and and their grades stay better. It leads to to moms being able to be more attentive to their children, and it pays. It, pay, it, it results in dads being able to be more attentive to their jobs because they're able to live instead of simply survive. And that's one of the things that I advocate is that you cannot allow these banks and servicers and investors to dictate to you that you are merely cattle and that your sole purpose on this planet is to survive. Your purpose on this yes. planet is to live. And you can only live a fulfilled life if you give it your all. And I advocate to all my clients, never give up until the end. Sometimes the end isn't what you want. It's not always perfect, but you've got to go to the end. If you don't go to the end, you'll always ask that question, what if I had done more? And, and that's what my clients, and, you know, you call them an army. They are an army, they, they, and I'm their general, yeah. and, and, they, and they follow me, and they believe me, and, and that's why it's so important that I tell I tell everyone the truth, and you know I invite my clients to come and watch me in court because I have to tell you I mean I I don't pull any punches I I'm I am I am a courtroom beast uh, you know lawyers uh, clients they'll all tell you the same thing that I go in ready for a fight I don't go in uh, you know looking to, to make deals I don't go in mm -hmm. looking to pity pat I go in looking to knock people out and and that's my thing I I go for the knockout I have no interest. Um, in going in and conciliating things, unless that's what my client wants. Because if that's what my client wants, it's my obligation as their attorney, as their counsel, to do that. But my position is go forward. You know, I posted on my, my Facebook the other the other day from Alfred Lord Tennyson into the Valley of Death. I feel like that every day. 
that I that I am I'm the 600 and, and that I am I ride into that valley of death every day. Um, and I'm not I fear I don't fear it. I fear no evil. I, I go forward because I, I feel like I've been blessed by the Holy Spirit, by my family, by my friends, by the lawyers that work with me, people like you who believe in me to give me the strength to keep going forward without without uh, without cowering. I, I I can't cower. I don't cower. And that's what 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 you do to for for, for people. We are moved and inspired by by your work and by your dedication. And and that's why uh, how like we as a homeowners how we started connecting with each other, networking and 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 um, and and giving inspiration to each other because you know that this fight is so like it takes out everything from you. You are not you are not the same person. You are not ready for your family life for your professional life, this fight changed you completely. And we really need to be around uh, people who face the same situation because unless you are really in this fight, you can never understand what does it mean to, to, to face it every single day. I want to ask you, uh, when you said that you are, when you go to the court, you go to fight, not to settle. Uh, my last show on, on Sunday, it was so much controversy because uh, we were talking about mortgage modifications. And I was never for modification when we know that, uh, like if you know that your mortgage is uh, fraudulent, I was never for modification. But that was two years ago when I started this fight, when I started investigating and finding out about fraud, I was thinking like it's enough to have to find the, the fraud and then just go in front of the judge and everything will be all set. You know and we all know now that it's not the case. So many people, uh, first of all, they, they don't have, they don't want to go into a long litigation for years. So they are, uh, they are for modifications. And I think that our obligation is to let them know that there is an option if they want to go into modifications. So I just want to, your position. What do you think about mortgage modifications? And, and uh, like, for example, I have fraudulent mortgage. And if my bank offered me modification tomorrow, and if I say, yes, I would like to, to do modification, even though that I know that I'm adding one more fraud, what do you say to me if you were my lawyer? I'm, I'm going to say to you, you have to do what makes your life better. And, and, and as an attorney representing many people, I have to re, I have to remember this every day that every client is unique. And, and I posted that the other day because every client is unique. I can't back off a settlement for someone that wants one for the greater good because that's not as an attorney what I what I do. Maybe as as an author that's what I can do. Maybe as a politician that's what I can do. But as an mm-hmm. attorney, if someone if I can deliver a modification to someone. That And I'll give you a, a prime example. I'm going to give you an example from some folks that, that signed a, a modification with me on Friday. They, they had been foreclosed on over a year ago. I was able to have their foreclosure reversed. I was able to have the principal balance on the house reduced by $133,000 to market value wow. from, from an incredibly overinflated principal balance with a, with a, with a modification interest rate of 32 Five percent uh, amortized over 30 years. Their, their payment went from nearly 2,300 a month down to 1,100. How do I tell a client not to take that because I think it's fraud? I do think it's fraud. I do know that the assignments are bad, and I do know that the documents are bad. But I'm able to make sure that my people, my clients, my family can live in their home and be safe. That's my obligation. So, do I yes. like modifications? No. But I, are they a necessary part? Of, of saving lives, of saving this country? Of course they are. But somewhere down the road, even that modification is going to come under a microscope because nothing mm-hmm. that we've done in that modification has fixed the fraud. No one has, yeah. has been given a, a, a you know a get-out-of-jail-free card. The fraud still exists. And if my clients were to default on their modification, they would still have a case because they were forced into the modification by the realities and, and the difficulties of life. So... Do I advocate them? No. Do I accept them as part of this business? Absolutely. I have no choice to. Yes, because I completely agree with you. Because if it if we were in the perfect world, and uh, this this uh, issue and this fraud will be uh, already uh, over, because we have we already have existing laws that are not being. Uh, 
applied. So uh, we have to do whatever is best for for uh, for people. So I mean, uh, a lot of people don't have. Uh, money to hire a lawyer and if, even if you do have a money I'm talking with people all, all around the country and there are not lawyers like you George there are not lawyers who are ready to face uh, this fraud to do investigation and to fight it I, I spoke with somebody I think from Michigan and uh, he told me that he he interviewed at least five lawyers and after uh, like to decide which one he was going to hire and he said after every talk, like, lawyer told him, like, oh, thank you so much. I learned a lot from you. So, you see, it's just like if we have, that's what I said the other day, if every state has at least one George Babak situation in, in, in our courts and, and it will be much, much different. But we don't have George Babak in every state. That's why people are forced to, do, uh, to try to find another option. Well, what I want, what I want to say is that when I when I first started this, I, I started it alone, and, and I you know, and, and you talk about lawyers hiring other lawyers. I was fortunate to to engage a young man by the name of Corey Allard, who who has a lot of the same traits as me. You know, he 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 like I stands on the edge of the cliff every day, expecting to be pushed off, but with no fear, and and, and he's grown into an incredibly um, skilled. Uh, litigator and and he too is a beast and and I've hired other lawyers Huey Benjamin who's had so much success in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts success that that other lawyers and and I had a client post on my Facebook saying that we did in six weeks what six years of Ivy League lawyers couldn't get done it's true you know why because we love what we do it's not about yeah. I don't keep track of how much money I make on every client. That's secondary. Mm -hmm. You know, I've made. I've been a lawyer for 27 years. I've made money. I've lost money. But what you can't make is is what this. What you can't you can't um, uh, you can't put a dollar figure on what pleasure and what joy I get when I can call someone and say your foreclosure is canceled. You're safe, and, and you know you're in my arms. I, there's nothing that I could, that I, I love more than being able to say that. And and and, it's, and there is a very very steep learning curve on this. This this learning curve on on the material that we deal with is so steep that I, and I'm you know I say this all the time and, and you know my dad said last night but I probably shouldn't say this is that when it comes to to this material you know we we know far more than what the judges know the judges don't understand this because the judges don't deal with it on a day, sorry my my dogs are saying oh, my my dogs don't my my dogs my you know judges don't deal. Judges don't deal with it on a daily basis. They don't live it. They don't learn it. And they don't understand it. And that's the sad part. Some judges do. Many judges don't. And, you know, and they look for any possible way to squeeze you out of court. So you have to keep coming back. Like, you know, this, this whole issue of, of standing, uh, standing not to challenge the, the, the effects of the house, how obtuse. What an obtuse theory for a judge to ever say the Constitution of the United States states guarantees that we have a stake in what happens to our property. And I argue that every day. Now, I have to say some judges get it, some judges don't. Am I going to vilify any judges? Not unless I get a call and I'm asked about particular judges, and, and maybe that's going to happen. But at this point, I want to say that I and the, and the lawyers that work on behalf of the beleaguered homeowners know so much more than what the judges know that it's, it's actually frightening. And what's even more frightening is that the attorneys that represent the banks do their best to keep judges in the dark. They lie to judges. They, they, put, they cite cases that are make-believe. I mean, I could point to cases, and I will point to one particular case. It's, it's pending in the First Circuit District Court. It's the Peterson versus GMAC case. The, the attorneys that represented GMAC in that case committed outright fraud. They tricked Judge Zobel into writing a decision that is flawed, fundamentally flawed. I wrote a personal three-page letter to Judge Zobel. You can find that on my website. When I told Judge Zobel that you relied on lies, and you know what? A case is pending in the First Circuit, and I hope the First Circuit realizes that, that Judge Sobel was tricked, and, and the, it's eight, you're able to trick judges. The 
because judges don't have enough time to commit all resources to this. All I do in my practice right now is this. I do nothing else. And I'll never do anything else. When this is done, then I'll be done. And I'm, I'll write a book. And, and you know, I will, I will say things and I will, I will uh, let people know things that have happened that I'm not allowed to let know happen because of confidentiality agreements, because mm-hmm. of of the stricture that's put upon me, uh, you know, by, by the federal rules. Where every time I have a negotiation with a client before the special master in the special master program that I was able to establish in Rhode Island, I'm bound, um, you know, to stay quiet. Staying quiet kills me because of the filth that I hear in these negotiations. It, it destroys me. But someday I'll be beyond the reach of the court and they won't be able to tell me what I can say. And then when I, I say what, what I can say, it will be mind blowing. People's people's brains will literally explode because of I what bet. is going on. Even I the bet. lawyers, because... even the lawyers, don't know who they represent. They come in and they say we represent the servicer. They don't have any idea who they represent. The real parties are they're they're, they're an amorphous concept of of humanity they don't really exist there is no investor i'm convinced that there is no investor that's the thing that's the thing that's the board as you said at the beginning um this is not like any any practice or any case that any lawyer had before i think this is the first time in the history of this country that it, that we are facing mortgage securitization fraud which is not affecting only the homeowners like being uh, uh, in danger to lose their homes. They are losing their jobs. Economy is going down because of this fraud. And so many families are coming apart because of this fraud. And you are, uh, you understand that. That's why you are, you are so passionate. And, and you, I know, and I feel that you are fighting for, for this country because we are losing that. I came to this country in 95. It was promised land and it's still promised land for me because I saw what it means to be outside of this country. But this country, I mean, I love, I love Americans. They don't even realize how, how great people like they are. And, and to see what's happening to these people by their government who are close, if, 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 if government is not corrupt, then the other part of the government is just closing their eyes in, in front of this enormous fraud. They don't care that, that we are losing not only middle class, but everybody is losing here, but the, but the bankers. So I, uh, I, I agree. I've, I've never seen such a, a group of protected individuals um, as, as bankers. You know, I, I liken them, and, you know, maybe not politically correct, but I liken, I liken them – to mass murderers because that is what they do. Mm-hmm. They commit they commit genocide. It is it is truly genocide, and, and and they are looking to wipe people out. There is no interest in yeah. in some some middle ground. They are looking to wipe people out. You know, when you asked me about modifications, what immediately came to my mind was how hard was it for Robert E. Lee to meet with with. Lincoln at Appomattox and, and surrender based upon everything that he believed, but he knew that not to, to reach that middle ground would result in further carnage and death. This is why Judge McConnell in the state of Rhode Island has established the federal master program, which is one of a kind in the country and, and which, in my opinion, should be taking place in, in every state in the country because he realized that what was happening was carnage, was was rape, and I, and I you know yes. I use these words that are powerful, but that's what it is. You know, it's yes, rape. Last okay. week, last, last week on my on my on my Facebook, you know, I I, I quote I, I quoted something that I said to Judge Rubine, uh, you know, when I said that that the clients that the banks in in essence shimmied down the chimney and stole my client's house like the Grinch that stole Christmas, and you know, mm-hmm. but I said that because I thought most people could relate to to watching the Grinch steal Christmas. And every day, the banks, they don't just steal Christmas. They steal lives. They steal lives. They they steal hope. They steal love. They 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 steal steal. honor. They steal everything. Yes. I I, I used to say, um, I used to write my blog more often than than, than now. I don't have time. But I used to say, like, they stole our past, present, and they're stealing our future. And we really, like, 
if we don't do something now, and I mean, we're doing everything humanly possible to put this out, to, to, to spread the news about this, but if we don't clean this up now, then our kids will end up in the even worse situation because I bet that they are preparing some new investments uh, to, to, to go out and to, to sell based on fraud because nothing is being done to them. They are not being criminally prosecuted. People are losing their homes. The, uh, I mean, it just continuously going around, and uh, people feel like it doesn't matter what I do, uh, this is not going to change, which I don't believe. I do believe that we have to, to organize and to talk about this all the time. And now when you mention Judge Rubin, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, about the petition that I know that was going around for Judge Rubin, and I did sign it. It is... Uh, his interpretation of Statute 341124, effect of assignment of mortgages, is incorrect. Correct. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And I will beg everybody, we have so many listeners, and I will share this petition again on my Facebook today, so I please beg everyone to go there and sign it. Can you talk a little what? bit more about this petition? I will. Let, let me first start by saying that, that Judge Allen Rubine is not a bad man. He's really not a bad man. Uh, he was put into in charge of, of the MERS calendar, which was established in Rhode Island because I had filed so many lawsuits in the state of Rhode Island. And I don't believe that when he was placed in charge of the calendar that, that he had, nor did the presiding justice, have any idea of how complicated this issue really was. And to apply simple rules of, of contract theory to what took place with the securitization of loans, with, with, Mer, with the involvement of, of the worst criminal of all being MERS and, and the animals that uh, use MERS um, at, as a shield and as a sword, I think he came in with blinders on. And, and early on, um, he became, I think, overwhelmed um, with cases. And the petition was, was brought up by, by a real staunch ally of mine um, because I would share with, with this ally of mine all of the decisions that Judge Rubin would make, and many of them would come down against me, and, and the, the decisions, and many of them would come down on my side, but, but the decisions were very inconsistent, and, and they were just so fundamentally flawed in, in light of the Rhode Island statute, because the, Rhode Island has a very, very specific um, conveyance statute, and that's one of the things that Judge McConnell in the federal court, when he established the federal program, realized was that, you know, in Rhode Island, we're governed by the conveyance statute. What, what Judge Rubine did was he came up with what I called, and, and maybe I was fresh when I did this, but I, I called his his decision the Rubine Rule of Assignments, which was basically this magical thing that would allow MERS, which, as we all know, if you're on the radio today, you know, anyone listening knows that MERS does not hold the beneficial interest in a mortgage. They don't hold notes. And in Rhode Island, in order, in order for an, an assignment of mortgage to take place, the, the whoever is assigning the mortgage has to also assign the note. Well, it's common sense that in Rhode Island, if you don't, if you're MERS and you don't have the note, you cannot possibly satisfy 341124, which is the conveyance statute. And, and Judge Rubine came up with this concept that the note, no matter where it was, would magically jump, and it would just magically jump from no matter who had. The note it would magically jump to whomever MERS allegedly assigned the mortgage to, and you know, and I used the Bevilacqua case out of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the concept of nemo dot in essence that you can't give what you don't have. I mean, my dad used to say to me all the time when I was little, George, if you've got five apples and you give away six oranges, how many apples? How many how many apples do you still have left? Well, I knew I still had five apples because I knew that apples and oranges are not the same thing, and and mm -hmm. that's what led to this petition being drafted by this particularly uh, aggressive uh, member of, of the, uh, of the Babcock army. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, it, it really needs traction because what's happened now is in Rhode Island, there were so many MERS cases. Another judge has now been appointed to the MERS calendar and that judge has taken the Rubine rule of assignments and made it even more absurd um, and, and, and has now take, is turning MERS in, into something more than even MERS thinks it is. And, uh, you know, 200 signatures on a petition to me is nothing. I'd like to see 2 million, quite frankly. Yeah. I'd like to see 2 million lawsuits filed. 
you know, you you asked me in, in our little pre uh, radio uh, the little note that you sent me. You know, I watched the the video in Ireland, and I and I'm thinking about mm-hmm. you know 100 200 cases. I, I'm thinking two million cases. If you want to bring about change, then bury the judiciary and force them to look at the, what is true in this. Don't don't file 500 cases, 700 cases as I've done. Mm-hmm. File file two million cases. Have the courage to do it on your own. You know, it's not that hard. If anyone wants a complaint, I'll post one. You can have it. File your own complaint. Don't be afraid of someone telling you you're going to get you're going to get prosecuted for strategic defraud. Strategic Mm -hmm. default. What's strategic default? I tell people all the time, why in the world would you ever pay anyone that has no right to collect your money? You know, services simply send money saying, okay, send send your money to me. If you don't send your money to me, you're going to be defaulted. Well, where's the proof that that servicer has any right to collect your money? Strategic default. What a joke. That's an absolute joke. Have no fear. Have no fear. This is the United States of America. Eventually, eventually, some judge, some somewhere is going to stand up and say, hey, enough. You know what? This is just plain wrong. This is the United States yes. of America. This is just plain wrong. It's, it, it, is, it is unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I don't know many. I know so much, but still it's nothing uh, comparing like uh, what other people like you uh, know about this fraud and it's just amazing that because uh, we feel like you, we choose our government representatives to go there to to protect us. We, we expected, like uh, some of us expected uh, from this uh, state attorney general's settlement that it's going to be something good for the homeowners. No, this was settlement for the banks because yeah, and it was a, homeowners... And it was a- it was a joke. That was an absolute joke, a slap in the face, comedy. I, you know, I have I have hundreds of clients that received checks from the Rhode Island Attorney General in the amount of eight hundred and forty dollars. Eight hundred and forty dollars is the is the price of of having your home stolen and your life changed. It's a, it's completely and utterly absurd. The, the, that settlement was an absolute joke. Yes, I mean, but can you? So you don't feel anything that any change after the settlement because I know one part of the settlement was the servicers have to follow the rules and I no, think it's no going, change. No is change. that going no to change. be in effect in January or do you expect any change from or they will just ignore it as they used to ignore everything else? No, they will ignore it. it I, I think that the settlement actually empowers them to do to commit more fraud, to commit more bad acts to refuse to, to follow statutes. Why? Because I have actually had judges say, well, they've received, you know, the attorney general, they've received money. They've received $840. It empowers them. I mean, back when the, OC, the original OCC report came out several years ago regarding MERS and Bank of America and, and many of the big banks, that did nothing. It was, I would use that in court, and I would cite it in court, and I would ask judges to take judicial notice of the fact that, that MERS uh, policies and their procedures had been questioned. And, and in essence, the judge would look at it and say, well, this isn't evidence for what? I don't care. They, they don't care. Ultimately, what I find is that most judges in, in most states, not just in Rhode Island, come down and say, did your client pay the mortgage? If your client didn't pay the mortgage, then we don't care who forecloses. And that's the sad reality. They don't care who forecloses. If you missed a payment... If you haven't made your payments, ultimately that's that's the decision maker because that's the easy way out. That's the way that nobody has to figure out what went on. Nobody has to figure out whether or not the note went into the trust at the appropriate time. Nobody has to figure out, you know, whether or not uh, Jeffrey Stefan is a real person or or if he's a, a robo clown. You know, I don't call these people robo signers, by the way. I call them robo clowns mm-hmm. um, because robo-clowns. that's what they are. They're robo clowns. They're not robo signers. Uh, you know, I, I I give no humanity to any of those people. Those people are robo clowns. Um, but judges don't care. Judges could care less. And you know, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, actually, I'm going to be arguing in the First Circuit the, the Cohane versus Aurora case on January 9th, and, and that whole case resol- revolves around a Massachusetts statute uh, 54B, which actually says that uh, no matter 
who signs it, robo signer or not, if they say they are who they are, you have no right to challenge it, and, and that's before the First Circuit. And I don't think that statute uh, was was written with the idea that MERS would ever exist. And again, it's another statute that has outlived its usefulness and, and needs to be crafted more carefully to MERS because the judge in that in that case in the federal court basically said that MERS is a fraud, but there was nothing he could do because the statute didn't allow him to. So, I mean, there's one, there's, yes. there's one to watch, you know? Yes, and, and this is, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing, like, how, how much fraud and how, how many layers of this fraud are existing, but still uh, you have to fight so hard to, to prove it because, as you said, like, judge, if they don't ask you the reason why you didn't pay the mortgage, but was the reason behind it. For them, for most of them, it's enough that you didn't make a payment and they will listen to the bank's lawyers. And I want to ask you something else. Do you know what, what was happening with LPS and that um, uh, the ex- uh, Doc uh, ex. Exec- executive, yes. And, but the executive was uh, uh, prosecuted for the, for, the, for the fraud. And we know that LPS is not the only one here in Massachusetts. We have Harmon Law. We have uh, many other like foreclosure mills. However, what I find out, people are telling me that they were contacted, like they were asking so many lawyers, like why don't you file a lawsuit against these foreclosure mills? It's not only to 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 go and and um, defend wrongful foreclosure as a homeowner, but actually why do we have more lawyers? to go after these foreclosure mills that are uh, presenting fraudulent documents to our court. And many lawyers uh, are saying that they can't do that because it's hard to go like lawyer after lawyer and it's hard to prove it. So, I mean, again, for me, fraud is so obvious, but I'm not a lawyer and I was never arguing anything in front of a judge. So I I just, uh, I still can't comprehend how can this be hard to prove and it's so much out there? Well, here's the thing. You know, I, I made a, an effort uh, to, to go after Harmon. I made an effort to go after Andrew Harmon. I engaged a, a handwriting expert, and you've probably seen that report on the Internet, and I did everything within my powers um, to attack Harmon Law and, and to prove mm-hmm. that, um, you know, they were operating above the law, outside the law, and you know, I was uh, I was beaten back uh, by by many different um, agencies for doing that. And uh, you know, at this point, my focus is uh, not on taking on harm and law, but it's on mm-hmm. ta- taking on what they do. Um, you know, it's not my job, and, and I, you know, and I don't really have standing to criminally investigate harm and law. That, that's for the mm-hmm. Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the Attorney General of the State of Rhode Island to do. And, you know, quite frankly, I, I don't know when and if that's ever going to happen for the very same reason, because, you know, I, I'm going to be honest, I've met with representatives of the Attorney General's office, and mm-hmm. the same thing is said. Did they pay their mortgage? You know, there, there's no... They, they, they have very little um, concern about the consumer, um, you know, unless it's something that's going to get ink. A sympathetic, a sympathetic uh, person is not one that has not paid their mortgage. That's, you know, in essence what I was told. Okay. And I met with Attorney General Patrick Lynch's office before, um, you know, he moved on with his career and Peter Kilmartin became the Attorney General in Rhode Island. And, and uh, you know, I, I brought in clients. I brought in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents that I, I you know, were clearly fraudulent. Uh, and uh, you know, it was basically cast aside. And, and I never had any. Uh, there was never any follow up. The only follow up was sending eight hundred forty dollar checks to my clients. That, that was it. <laughs> so uh, until until law enforcement decides that it is important, um, you know, I I'm going to be honest. I can't do it. A single attorneys can't do it because when you sue yeah. Harmon, you're not just suing Harmon, you're suing Wells Fargo, you're suing MERS, you're suing, yeah. you're suing everyone that they represent and, and they bring such force and they have such financial capability to, to whether it's yeah. to, to just fight you or whether it's to make payoffs. I, you know, I don't know what they do, but they're able to, to move on. So am I indicting harm in law? No, it's not my job to indict them. Uh, they have not been found to do anything criminal, so it's not for me 
at this point to say okay. that they did. All I can say mm-hmm. is that I fight what they do because I know what they do is wrong, and I know what they do um, is is always right on the fence. You know, I mean, I can say this as an attorney. I wouldn't sign those documents. I know that I wouldn't do it because I know what they are and what they mean and what they do. Um, so, you know, it, it's a tough it's a tough one for me. It's a tough one for any lawyer um, to, to sue Harmon Law or to sue anyone like that because it's not yes. our job. It's just not our job, and yes. we don't have the financial resources to do it. And quite frankly, I don't, I don't think I have a client uh, in, in all the clients that I have that want me to do that. They, they want me to, to, to get them – the, the best deal possible for them, and, and that does not include proving that Harmon Law is the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you something, one of the stories from one of my um, fellow foreclosure fighters here in, in Massachusetts. She called, she has, uh, uh, her mortgage has a Harmon Law involved. So she was trying, uh, and it's so much fraud on her, on her mortgage. So she called, uh, somebody told her to call the Boston, uh, Massachusetts Bar Association to complain. She spent an hour on the phone. They told her to call State Attorney General. She called Martha Coltry's office. They told her to call U.S. Attorney General. And it was like going into circles. Even these right. agencies, they, they don't want to, to tell you how to proceed or or what to do. It really looks either they are all stupid or either they are all corrupt. But it's yeah. not I mean, it's, I'm going to say this. I, I think it's. I think it's because it's so. It's just hard, and it's so new, and people just don't understand it, and they don't have the resources. I think to to, to put towards prosecution. I, I I really believe that to be the case. It's just it's a money thing. The banks have so much money. They have more money than the federal government. They have more money than every agency you mentioned. So they're they're able to put up a fight and to actually beat the federal government because they're bigger than the federal government. Uh, You know, when you say too big to fail, I I don't believe that, but I understand it because they control absolutely everything. What what is amazing to me is that they're actually able to control the minds of attorneys that work for them because I I can't imagine as as a human being doing what they do. I, I, I I can't. You mean I know I knew when I was growing up as a little boy it was wrong to steal a piece of bubble gum from you know from the candy store and I still know it's wrong to steal. I don't know what or or who taught the lawyers that work for the other side because they simply don't understand yeah. it's wrong to steal the piece of gum from the candy store. They do it yeah. every day and they do it with impunity because they know that no one is ever going to call them on it ever. Yes. Yeah. And and then uh, I want to ask you also uh, about, uh, I mean, you don't have, and I know that you can't share names with us, but if you can tell us one, at least one of your success story, is there, any, is there any any case that has ended without modification, but that, that you prove that they didn't have the standing? And because what I heard, what I heard was Go going on around sorry. the country. No, I, I don't. It's like there are a lot, even here in, in Massachusetts, um, situation is brighter than before because we have a lot of dismissed cases, but we dismiss without prejudice, which means that bank can come back again and file another lawsuit against you. So, so even if your case gets dismissed, it's still not the end. So, do you like how or? When can we see the end of this? Do you have any? Do you know about any case that has been dismissed with with prejudice, which means that no. bank cannot? No, no, nothing. No, no. And and actually, last week was a was a, a real good week where, you know, the banks have now moved into trying to obtain summary judgment, and you know we've been able now to stave off summary judgments, which which is like the ticket to finally be able to to do discovery and to finally dig in, uh, you know, to to to. to how this whole thing ticks, and, and I'm excited about that. Um, there have been no no cases dismissed with prejudice. Uh, you know, again, I think that that's a testament to the fact that judges simply don't get it, and, and they they mm-hmm. I don't know when they're going to get it. I don't know if they're ever going to get it, and I'm not saying all of them because I I want to I, again I want to praise Judge McConnell. I want to praise Judge Young out of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You know, these are some judges that really get it, that really understand that that they have an opportunity in their lifetime to change the course of human events. 
And, yeah. and that's why I feel like I have the, the opportunity to change the course of human events. Now, I might fall flat on my face, and I may lose, but but you know what? At the end of the day, I know I've done my best. And I think that, that yeah. these judges, these particular judges, really understand that that how important this is, and they really understand the layers of this. This is not a simple issue of standing. This is not a simple issue of contract. This is an this is an issue of of major manipulation of the financial markets of the United States of America. This is major manipulation of statutes in every single state in the country by MERS. I mean, MERS really is is the facilitator of this. It is the catalyst of, of you know chemical explosions. It, it is in my mind, MERS is is the financial Chernobyl of this country. Um, you know, and and it's I fight it every day. I, I think it's it's yeah. a, a terrible a terrible business. It's a terrible business model, and what it allows banks to do, because many judges don't understand how it works, is incomprehensible to me. And that's why in every lawsuit I file, I name MERS and I claim that they've committed fraud in every lawsuit that I file. That's great, and I just want to share with you one of our listeners just posted like. Uh, to tell you, like the banks to use copies of the note and mortgage to seal our homes, we should be able to submit a picture of our home to satisfy the foreclosure. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. Early on before I, I obtained, because, I, you know, as you know, I have an automatic stay in the state of Rhode Island. Any foreclosure case that I file in the state of Rhode Island is automatically stayed. People can't be foreclosed. They can't be evicted. But before that, I literally would send people from my office to the auctions and, and stand in the way of the auction. I've had people run over at auctions by, wow. by auctioneers. I've, my people have been run over, but that's the type of people that work for me. These people, they really love what we do. They come and they watch me argue so they, so they can understand. I mean, I'm talking about yeah. secretaries, paralegals. They come and they watch me argue because they need to understand. They have the passion, but they need to understand more. But picture this. Picture a guy who does title searches for me at an auction, trying to stop an auction, being run over by a car. That's what it's come to. (laughs) That is what it's come to. Because many people feel and many people say that this is war. This is a war, and we are in a war. Uh, We are not killing each other, thank God, but we are really fighting for our survival, and the other side doesn't have any empathy doesn't have, they don't care about justice, they care only about their greed and how to cover up their fraud. So people really feel that uh, let's do whatever needs to be done in order to stop foreclosure. And, and I can imagine that people that work for you, that they have the same passion like I, I still have. Well, I mean, I, I want to say this. Early on, uh, I was given an opportunity by Buddy Cianci, who you know, who is a, a national figure. He has his own radio station here in in Providence, and he gave me the opportunity to come on the air several times to discuss this. And and he's a former attorney, and, and to his credit, he was able to figure out because he did not want to be an ignorant interviewer. He was able to figure out exactly what was going on, so he could ask me questions. And every mm-hmm. time I come on, he and I, he and I have such intelligent discourse that people end up understanding what I'm doing, I, yeah. which, which makes me wonder why can't judges and why can't politicians and why can't policymakers understand? If Buddy Cianci, who has a radio show and he's a radio personality, although he has a law degree, can understand it so he can interview me appropriately, why cannot super educated people understand this and why cannot our government understand as i said you know, that this yeah, yeah. is a this is the time that we can save this country tax cuts liberals I, it doesn't make a difference this is how you save america one house at a time yes and uh i talked to to, to marla this morning and uh marla said the same thing like uh, judges don't understand it. and actually i said I think that they do understand, George. They do understand. They just want us to believe that they don't because if they tell us that they understand, then they will have to do something. And there are uh, at least 60 million MERS mortgages in this country. It will be, for them, it will be disaster. For the banks, it will be disaster. But for us, it will be justice. So I think it's my opinion, not yours, 
that they do understand, but they just are so afraid of how deep this fraud is, and they are afraid the general public will find out about about this, and then uh, it's better for them to just like uh, ignore this and then steal our homes and approve stealing of our homes and actually do their job. Well, I'll tell you, if I could file 60 million lawsuits, uh, I would file 60 million lawsuits. That's how committed I am to this, and that's how that's how fervent my belief is that it, it is a broken system. It is a it is a broken way of doing business. Uh, it, it's broken economically. It's broken morally. Um, and as I said, if I could file every one of those cases, yours truly would do it on his own. There are other lawyers. Out, there are other lawyers out there across the country, and trust me, I read their cases. Um, you know, I, I read the cases that come down out of Michigan and that come down out of Washington. Every case that comes down, I read it. I read it because someone like you posts it. I read every case. Mm-hmm. I understand every case, and I use every case. I want to. I want to give you an example. I, there was a brief that I wrote in the MERS court in Rhode Island on a case where uh, the case was. Just, it was determined that uh, I did not have standing to bring my case. I cited 72 cases, and in the opinion written by the superior court judge in Rhode Island, not one of my cases was cited, distinguished, questioned. It was a simple bootstrap decision. So your answer or your statement is correct. They don't want to understand because if they did, they mm-hmm. would have read those 72 cases. Yes. yes. And I, 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 I would like to ask you just uh, what, two, more, two more questions. I know that you, you, you have to go, but I want to, our, our listeners to know that you can hear you can hear my little three-year-old in the background asking yes. daddy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I know I know that you're babysitting your, your your little one. Thank you, thank you so much for 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 your time. Let me ask you just um, this: What do you think? What what would be like if somebody tell you today, okay, George, uh, let's find a solution for this? What would your advice be? How, like if if banks want to cooperate, if our government wants to cooperate, what would be solution for all these that have already lost their homes to the wrongful foreclosure? or people who are facing imminent foreclosure right now? Well, you, you, I'm probably going to say something that, that you don't want me to say, but I would be Robert E. Lee, and, and I would probably surrender, but I would surrender upon my terms, and the terms would be to have uh, mortgages right-sized, um, to, have, to have the amount that is, that is overstated forgiven. Um, it's probably going to have to involve um, nobody going to jail because if somebody's going to go to jail, they're going to take their heels in. It would mm-hmm. it would take a compromise of massive proportions, but I would be willing to accept that compromise of massive proportions to get back to square one to start the mm-hmm. game over. I would I would be willing to start the game over, and, and but but this time play by the rules. I would be willing to do that, and it's hard for me to say that because. You know, my, my, father ra- my father raised me, never surrender. Illegitimate non carborundum. It means don't let the bastards get you down. I believe in that 100%. But what I would do in the interest of saving my country and saving my clients would be to start the game over, but start it in, under, the, under the right rules and not under these phantom rules. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. I will let you go now. You go, go back to, to, your, to your little one. And uh, I just want listeners to know that George promised to be back after holidays in January. We will have another episode with him. And I wish you Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and take a break. You you so deserve it. Thank you for, for everything, you, George. You too. And let, let me say this to anyone that's listening out there. The important thing is that you never surrender. You know, we, we you lose, you get back up. You fall down, you get back up. You lose a leg. You get your leg replaced or you get yourself a, a walker, but you keep going. You know, you stumble, yes. you get up, and you keep going. Because the day you quit, you die. Yes, that's so true. Thank you for oh, the inspiration. Peace. And have a great day. Peace to you and to all my friends. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, John. You, you bet. And thank you, everybody, for listening. I, I'm hearing that there has been some technical issues with the show, that some people couldn't hear the whole show. I hope that. Um, we, uh, that it will be fixed when you when we replay. So hopefully that uh, everything that George said has been saved. Uh, however, as I said to you, uh, he is going to be back with us in January, 
and you can send your questions for him to foreclosurefraud12 at gmail.com. Um, thank you again for being with me today. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Happy Monday tomorrow, and have a great day. Bye-bye.